distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Penelope Matthew and I'm the Freilich Foundation Professor here at the Australian National University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual Herbert and Balmay Freilich Lecture Against Bigotry and Intolerance. Before we commence, I want to acknowledge that we meet on Ngunnawal land. I acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of this continent whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. I pay respect to the elders of the community and acknowledge their descendants who are present tonight. I would also like to acknowledge that we have Balmain Freilich here with us tonight, and I want to especially welcome her. The Freilich Foundation is very proud to be hosting this lecture on the topic of gay marriage to be delivered by Professor Raymond Gator, the eminent writer and philosopher. He's been doing the media rounds today, so you may have had a foretaste of what he's going to say, but I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing the full lecture tonight. Before I introduce Professor Gator, though, I'm delighted to introduce the former Chief Minister of the ACT, John Stanhope, to give some introductory remarks on the topic. John is currently a professorial fellow in the Australian New Zealand School of Government based in the University of Canberra. While in office as our Chief Minister, he served the ACT community with great distinction and took many initiatives in the area of human rights. His government, of course, introduced the ACT's Human Rights Act in 2004. John took on the Howard government on many human rights issues, including the anti-terrorism bill of 2005, which he famously posted on his website so that the community could debate its contents and the various breaches of human rights involved in that legislation. Most relevantly to our topic tonight, it was under John Stanhope's leadership that the ACT passed the Civil Unions Act in 2006, sparking another stout with the federal government. So please join me in welcoming Professor John Stanhope. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, I thank Renata and the Friday Foundation for the invitation to speak this evening about the political and uh, legislative history here in the ACT uh, of the recognition of same-sex relationships. It's a record that I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, and I might just say it's a record of which um, I'm proud. Uh, my party, the Australian Labor Party, has now been in government in the ACT for just over 10 years. When we came to government in 2001, I announced that we would progressively review every piece of ACT legislation and all ACT government practices and remove or terminate all that discriminated against gay, lesbian and transgender and intersex members of the ACT community. We completed the majority of that task in our first term of government and all we amended over 70 pieces of legislation that contained provisions which on their face discriminated against gays and lesbians. The majority of the discriminatory provisions might be described as petty, they were certainly gratuitous, and it might be fair to suggest that some uh, were the result of unthinking uh, or careless drafting. Some were, of course, quite deliberately discriminatory. But the suite of reforms or amendments, the most controversial during that process was the removal of the bar on same-sex couples adopting children. Uh, we nevertheless persevered, it was quite a rigorous uh, community uh, and uh, assembly debate, uh, and we did remove that particular prohibition. It was, incidentally, uh, during the debate on the issue of uh, same-sex adoption that I received my first ever death threat, uh, regrettably more fire uh, during community debates uh, on issues around uh, removal of discrimination against gays and lesbians. In the campaign for the 2004 election, I was very clear that if re-elected, the Labor Party would finalise uh, our commitment to remove all lesbian discrimination uh, against gays and lesbians by legislating to afford same-sex relationships full functional equality for those of heterosexual couples. We had, in the months before the 2004 election, passed the Human Rights Act, in which we had adopted a Bill of Rights for the ACT. We won the 2004 election. Indeed, not only did we win, it remains the only one of the seven elections held uh, since ACT self-government, which produced a majority government. I've always thought not a bad mandate for gay marriage and not a bad mandate for bills of rights. If you'll indulge me, I thought I might 
uh, read uh, excerpts from the second reading speech I delivered when introduced in the Civil Unions Bill on 28 March 2006. In preparing uh, for this presentation this evening, it took me somewhat by surprise to realise that we were legislating on this issue six years ago. But the second reading speech does provide uh, a summary of the process followed, issues in the debate, and my government's thinking and attitude. I'll then go to some of the consequences that flowed uh, and uh, perhaps a couple of reflections. What I said nearly six years ago was this, and these are just a few excerpts. I'm pleased to present the Civil Unions Bill 2006. This is a very significant piece of legislation and a major step forward for equality for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and intersex members of the ACT community. It's clear from both the submissions received by the government in response to this discussion paper and from the letters received since I announced in December 2005 that the government will be moving to introduce this legislation that a great many people are keen to take the opportunity to have their relationship formally recognised. The passage of this legislation will bring the ACT to line with a growing number of jurisdictions worldwide. The Civil Unions Bill is a reflection of the government's commitment to the principle that all people are entitled to respect, dignity and the right to participate in society and to receive the protection of the law, regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity. The right to equal protection of the law is also stated in Section 8 of the Human Rights Act 2004, which prohibits discrimination in law or in practice in any field regulated by public authorities. There is increasing recognition in human rights and jurisprudence that the right to equal protection of the law includes positive obligations to ensure equal treatment. Thus, same-sex relationships must be treated equally unless there is an objectively justifiable reason to do otherwise. The ACT can find no such objectively justifiable reason to treat same-sex relationships other than equally. I ask anyone who may have concerns with this bill to ask themselves this question. What objectively justifiable reason is there to treat same-sex relationships any differently from loving, committed, heterosexual relationships? I concluded, uh, having gone into some uh, detail around the particular provisions of the bill, by saying, whilst I am satisfied the ACT is doing all it can to afford equal protection under the law to all people, people regardless of their sex or sexual orientation, it must be recognised that, without changes in the federal jurisdiction, this equal treatment will be limited to the ACT. My challenge to the federal government is to end its discriminatory treatment of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and intersex Australians and to amend federal laws so that relationships with same-sex couples are treated in the same way as relationships with opposite sex couples. The equality conferred by this bill is not only functional and practical, but also highly symbolic. The civil union will not simply be evidence of a loving, lifelong commitment between two people, but a piece of paper as proof. It will create the relationship being recognised. It's a distinction some may find subtle, but for the many same-sex couples who will use this law, I suspect it is anything but subtle. It is critical, I think, the Civil Union Bill to the Assembly. The bill was debated in detail on 11 May 2006. It was rigorously opposed by the Liberal Party. It was supported by the Greens. The bill had unanimous support in the Labor caucus. A conscience vote was not sought, nor was it granted by the caucus. The arguments against the bill were focused primarily on claims that the formal recognition of same-sex relationships belittled and diminished the status of marriage and the, and the centrality of the family in our society. Particular attention was paid during the debate to two particular provisions, one that provided that people not normally resident in the ACT uh, could also enter a civil union that came to the ACT for that purpose, and a provision which essentially mirrored the Marriage Act in relation to the age at which a person uh, might choose to enter a civil union, namely with the consent of a parent or guardian or an order of the court, 16 or 17. The Liberal Party and members of the Liberal Party, those that opposed, focused particularly strongly on what they called an unacceptable uh, provision that allowed people under the age of 18 to enter into a civil union, though they expressed no such concern uh, with heterosexual people under the age of 18 marrying. I formally closed the debate on the bill with the following statement. 
in a speech almost a decade ago for then Chief Justice of the Family Court, and I'm reading this now because I was giving this speech fresh, I'll say this again. In a speech almost a decade ago for then Chief Justice of the Family Court in Australia, Alastair Nicholson said that nothing could be more central to a definition of humanity than respect for the importance of each of us that each of us places upon enduring relationships. From today in the ACT, it's my hope that respect will be extended to all couples entering into an enduring relationship without regard to their sexuality. From today, I hope our definition of humanity may be enhanced in our regard for fundamental bedrock relationships, the relationships that lie at the heart of strong families may be strengthened. The step I hope we have the courage to take today will enhance the status of all of our enduring relationships and all of our families. The equality conferred by this legislation is practical in the sense that it provides equality under the laws of the Territory, but it is of course also highly symbolic. It does not merely provide evidence of an existing relationship as a registration scheme can, it creates that relationship. The difference may sound semantic to those who will never seek to formalise their relationships through a civil union, but it is far from semantic for those who will seek this law out and enjoy the protections it offers. It is real, it is profound, and it goes to the heart of the most important relationships some among us will ever have. It's easy for those of us personally unaffected by this law to either minimise its relevance or to overemphasise its effect. We've seen both approaches taken over the course of this debate. Some have argued that because gays and lesbians represent only a small proportion of our community, it's a waste of time and effort to accommodate their rights and entitlements in this way. I wonder, would those critics there make the same argument in relation to other minorities, say Indigenous people, or perhaps those with severe disabilities? This community does not confer human rights and social entitlements and recognition on the basis of numerical superiority. Not under this government, and not under any government that rejects discrimination and upholds equality. At the other end of the spectrum, over the course of this debate, we see the argument that this law fundamentally affects the status of marriage between a man and a woman. How can it be so? How can it have any effect whatsoever on my marriage, or the marriage of anyone in this chamber, or the marriage of anyone in this community? Is marriage so fragile an institution to, to suggest so? is simply insulting. I celebrated my 34th wedding anniversary this week with my wife Robin. We married in 1972. We have four children and will shortly welcome our fourth grandchild. My wife and my family are more important to me than anything in my life. Those of us who have enjoyed rich and enduring marriages might ask ourselves how recognising and respecting enduring relationships to others without regard to their sexuality diminishes our marriage or the institution of marriage. Those of us who enjoy rich and enduring marriages might ask ourselves how we would feel if we were to be suddenly and rudely informed that our love was a lesser love, the support we rendered each other was a lesser support, our right for respect and equality under law was a lesser right, purely and simply on the basis of our sexual preference. How would we feel to be told that our relationships were lesser relationships, that our families are lesser families, that is precisely the message we as a community have been delivering to same-sex couples and to their families. Today, I hope that message changes. Today, we welcome the opportunity to recognise in others what we cherish in our own lives. This government has worked hard to eliminate from the laws of the territory discrimination against gays and lesbians. The law before the Assembly today fulfils a pledge Labor made before the last election to seek a way to eliminate this final overt boundary to equality. Our society is built on primary relationships, relationships between committed couples and relationships between parents and children. They are the basis of our households, the foundation of our suburbs and the substance of our community. I believe that the law we debate today will make our community a stronger one, a more thoughtful one, a more respectful one and certainly a fairer one. I said earlier, that it was easy for those of us personally unaffected by this law to either magnify or minimise its significance. In fact, none of us is personally untouched by this law because its absence diminishes us all. To that extent, to that extent <coughs> its absence ought to be felt personally and profoundly by each of us, whatever the status of our own relationships or whatever our sexual preferences. 
while we discriminate needlessly against the man or the woman beside us, we are all diminished. Alistair Nicholson was right. Nothing is more central to our definition of humanity than the respect each of us places upon enduring relationships. Today I hope that the ACT can put on record that its respect and recognition are not based on something so irrelevant to our essential humanity as sexual preference. I commend the Civil Union's Bill to the Assembly. The Bill was passed. It came into effect on the 19th of May 2006. On the 30th of June 2006, 24 days later, the Governor-General, acting on the advice of the Commonwealth Attorney-General, Phil Ruddock, acting on the instructions of the Prime Minister John Howard, annulled it. In the explanatory statement accompanying the instrument of disallowance, disallowance signed by the Governor-General of the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth declared the disallowance this is the Commonwealth's explanatory statement. The disallowance of the Civil Unions Act 2006 supports the fundamental institution of marriage. The Marriage Act makes it clear that marriage is the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others voluntarily and to the law. This is the definition of marriage inserted in the Marriage Act by the Parliament in the Marriage Amendment Act 2004. The unique status of marriage is undermined by any, marriage, any measure that elevate other relationships to the same or similar level of public recognition and legal status. The Civil Unions Act 2006 created a statutory scheme for the recognition of relationships which bore a marked similarity to the Commonwealth scheme for the regulation of marriage. This legislation appears to undermine marriage, attempted to circumvent the Marriage Act 1961 and may have created ambiguity between civil unions and marriage. <coughs> that is the full explanation of the Commonwealth's decision to repeal this democratically um, and appropriately passed piece of legislation. The federal intervention was, of course, doubly disappointing. It was both a blunt assault on the democratic rights of the people of the ACT and on our desire as a community to be fair, to be just and to be non-discriminatory to all of our citizens. The ambivalence of my Federal Labor colleagues and the Labor Party generally rubbed salt into the wounds of our disappointment. We wound back the scheme and we legislated in terms that the Commonwealth most patronisingly was prepared to accept. Terms that did not provide functional equality for same-sex couples. After the defeat of the Howard Government and the election of the Labor Government to office, which was right for us, we enthusiastically and confidently introduced amendments to the Civil Unions Act into the Assembly with some excitement, amendments that would have restored the Act to its original form. You would understand my disappointment and that of my colleagues in the Government when the Rudd Government similarly rejected our proposal to afford same-sex couples the same respect and recognition afforded to opposite-sex couples. I remain to this day, put it mildly, disappointed that not a single voice from within the Australian Labor Party was raised in support of either our right to legislate as we saw fit or in support of gay marriage. Recent amendments to the ACT Self-Government Act have been passed to prevent a recurrence of the disallowance of an ACT law on a federal ministerial whim. The amendments were introduced and sponsored by Senator Bob Brown of the Greens. To conclude on a more, on a more positive note, Change is in the air once timid politicians around the whole of Australia and the federal and state parliaments are coming out from beneath the cones of silence. They are at last suddenly recognising and supporting this most fundamental of human rights of gays and lesbians. Or perhaps, to be fair, they've always recognised the human rights of gays and lesbians. They've simply been waiting for their constituents to let them know that's now safe uh, to, to, to publicly treat gays and lesbians equally and with respect. Heaven forbid, of course, that our politicians should have led the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, John.
for joining us and reliving really some of that history for us. And I'm sure John will be available to answer a few questions at the end. But now I'd like to introduce uh, our main speaker. Uh, we move from a practical and political to a very philosophical perspective. Raymond Gator was born in Germany in 1946, migrating to Australia with his parents in 1950. He's a professorial fellow at the Melbourne Law School, as well as the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne, and Emeritus Professor of Moral Philosophy at King's College in London. He's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. Gator's books, which have been widely translated, include, there are so many of them, Good and Evil, An Absolute Conception, Romulus, My Father, which of course was nominated by the New Statesman as one of the best books in 1999 and made into a feature film. A Common Humanity, Thinking About Love and Truth and Justice, which was nominated as one of the best books of 2000. The Philosopher's Dog, shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Award and the Age Book of the Year. Breach of Trust, Truth, Morality and Politics. After Romulus. As editor and contributor, Gaza, Morality, Law and Politics, Muslims and Multiculturalism. And with Alex Miller and Alex Scogron, seeing for all his worth, essays in honour of J.G. G. Rosenberg. Because he believes that it's a generally a good thing for philosophers to address an educated and hard-thinking lay audience, as well as his colleagues, he's contributed extensively to public discussion about reconciliation, collective responsibility, the role of moral considerations in politics, the Holocaust, genocide, crimes against humanity, education, and the plight of universities. And all of this, of course, makes him a perfect speaker for the Freilich Foundation. And we're delighted to welcome here him tonight to speak on the topic, gay marriage as important as race. Please welcome Raymond <laughs> Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, is this a lapel microphone also working? I mean, for the audience or just for the TV? It's just for this. Oh, okay. So I better stay, stay here. Okay. Uh, if, if I move away from this and you can't hear me, please just say, Oi, I can't hear you because otherwise I won't know. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Matthews, and um, also to Renata Grossi for uh, inviting me and to Mark Pierce for doing such wonderful work with the uh, publicity. I'm really very honoured uh, to have been invited to give uh, this uh, uh, lecture, and I'm, I'm very honoured and pleased uh, that uh, Valma uh, Friday uh, managed to be in the audience. And I'm also honoured because of the distinguished people who uh, preceded me. <clears throat> there is a, a terminological uh, uh, issue here. Uh, I hate the expression same-sex marriage because it sounds so bureaucratic. Uh, and uh, uh, I've, because people so often talk about gay marriage, that's the expression I, I've used, although I'm not sure if I should have, uh, instead of gay and lesbian marriage. But I hope, if, I, hope, I, hope I won't offend anybody if I uh, speak simply of gay marriage, meaning, of course, to cover gay and lesbian marriage. Uh, well, first I have to explain uh, my title because I suspect many of you, or some of you anyway, will find it odd, and some of you might find it even morally and intellectually irresponsible. Uh, it harks back to a conversation some years ago in London between two close friends. One I'll call simply Peter, and the other is Nick Drake, a poet, a novelist, a screenwriter, and a passionate gay. Uh, Peter and I expressed that that uh, dinner, conversation, sympathy for Rowan Williams, uh, also a fine poet, who had the misfortune to be appointed Archbishop of Canterbury when the Anglican Church threatened to split over the ordination of a handful of gay priests. Uh, the indignation of some ultra-conservatives in the church was further inflamed uh, by the fact that the newly ordained bishop supported gay priests. Hence the sympathy Peter and I expressed for Williams's ironic predicament. We agreed nonetheless, uh, and indeed we took it for granted, uh, that in order to avoid a split in the church, Williams would at least play down his support of gay marriage. 
Nick said, uh, uh, sorry, Gay clergy. Nick uh, said not a word, but I caught his eyes, and in their pained expression, I read these questions. Is it really so obvious that one shouldn't be prepared to split the church over this matter? Wouldn't it be different if racism were the issue? Nick's poem, Celebrating Gay Love and Death, had moved me deeply, as had his understanding of heterosexual love in some of its most passionate and destructive forms, understanding that he showed in his screenplay adapting my book from It's My Father to the Screen. Responding to the pain in Nick's eyes, I realised ashamed how little I had understood. Uh, in December, uh, there's to be a Labour Party caucus uh, which will discuss uh, whether uh, Parliament uh, should have a conscience vote. Oh, sorry, but it should recommend to Parliament that there be a conscience vote about gay marriage. Most commentators agree that were there to be such a conscience vote, it would almost certainly both be defeated. And probably some uh, people, uh, both Labour uh, and the opposition, would vote against it because I think it's not something over which to split the party or to lose votes. Christine Keneally, who spoke eloquently, uh, indeed, and also as a Catholic in support of gay marriage recently on Q&A, said uh, later that she didn't think it was a core issue, not one to define any important Labour Party agenda. Yet if the vote were on whether there should be marriage between black and whites, would anybody think that? Again, the question implicit in Nick's question is our discussion, you know, uh, implicit in our dinner time discussion, that question was, is it really so different? Well, it's my impression that many people uh, under 40 uh, are incredulous that this could be an issue at all. Uh, as incredulous as I think they are that anybody would think that race should ever be a legitimate reason for denying someone what is enjoyed by their fellow citizens. Unless there are astonishing political, cultural and ethical reversals in the next few years, most countries in the West will, I'm sure, permit gay marriages. We will then be as incredulous, I believe, as we, uh, as we now are uh, about race, that this could ever have been a serious matter for discussion. Older members of the audience will remember the insouciant racism that was for the most part part of our upbringing. It's a small thing uh, uh, from one perspective, but I remember with shame that I and all my friends, and indeed my parents and their friends, were entirely untroubled by the contempt shown for black Africans in Tarzan comics and films. This was when I was a kid. And I could go on to give many more dramatic and serious examples, but I'm sure you won't need them. Julia Gillard has often mocked Tony Abbott for being on the wrong side of history. On this matter, she's going to join him. In uh, my book, A Common Humanity, and also in the afterword to the second edition of Good and Evil, I've discussed an aspect of a kind of racism directed against people whose skin colours and features, skin colour and features are different. The qualification there is necessary because racism comes in different kinds. Anti-Semitism, I think, is different from the denigration of blacks and Asians. And both have many dimensions, psychological, social, and political. The same is true of opposition to gay marriage. And later I'll comment on the differences. My interest, as you'll discover, is philosophical. I want to map a conceptual landscape in which I locate the different kinds of opposition to gay marriage and similarities and the differences between those forms of opposition to gay marriage and racism. Racism of a certain kind, not all kinds as I said, for it's a complex phenomenon, but the kind usually connected with skin colour, almost always involves an incapacity on the part of racists to see that anything could go deep in the lives of their victims. For racists of that kind, it's really unintelligible that sexuality, for example, could mean to them what it does to us. In uh, A Common Humanity, and also in that afterword that I mentioned, I give an example of a woman whose son had been killed in an accident. <clears throat> I called her M. Only a few days after his death, she was watching television where she saw a documentary 
to show Vietnamese mothers grieving over their children who'd been killed in American bombing raids. At first she leaned forward in her chair towards the television as though to express her sense that she and the Vietnamese shared a common affliction. After a minute or two, she sank back and said, but it's different for them, they can just have more. By themselves, her words will not tell us what she meant. To understand that, we need to know some things that she did not mean. She did not mean that she was physically incapable of having more children. Nor did she mean that because the Vietnamese had for many years suffered trauma of war, they had become brutalised, losing the sense that they had and that we have of what it means to lose a child. Had she meant that, she would have believed that when life returned to normal for the Vietnamese, they might recover an understanding of what it means to love and to lose a child. Fully in possession of that understanding, they could not then just have more, just as she thinks of herself, that she cannot have more. Or she might have accepted that she shouldn't have generalised so hastily that only some of them had been brutalised to that degree. But her remark, intended to apply to all Vietnamese, is not what we normally think of as fallen generations. I made the same point about James Isdell, a protector of Aborigines in Western Australia in the 1930s. Responding to the question, how did he feel taking mothers from their children, Isdell answered that, quote, he would not hesitate for a minute to separate any half-caste from his Aboriginal mother, no matter how fran frantic her momentary grief might be at the time. They soon forget their offspring, he explained. Our children, our, in inverted commas, are irreplaceable. Theirs are not. That's the implication of what Ben and Isdell said. Taking their remarks as expressions of a certain kind of racism, we can see that the attitudes they portrayed extend to virtually every aspect of the lives of the Aborigines and the Vietnamese. Nothing M and Isdell thought goes deep with them, not their loves or their griefs or their joys. And in a perfectly natural sense of the expression, they saw their victims as less than fully human. They knew, however, that Aborigines and Vietnamese form attachments are mortal, vulnerable to misfortune, that they're rational, have interests, that indeed they're persons, as philosophers tend to define them, when they discuss whether machines or dolphins or fetuses are persons. They did not suffer from ignorance of the facts when they thought uh, about they did not sorry, they didn't suffer about ignorance of facts in relation to their victims of their denigration. And when I speak of facts here, I'm thinking of facts as a judge might think of them when he says to an emotional witness, stick to the facts, please. Although the grief of the women who'd lost their children was visible and audible to M and to Esther, neither saw in the women's faces or heard in their voices grief that could lacerate their soul and mark them for the rest of the days. It was, in the sense I suggested earlier, literally unintelligible to them that sexuality, death, and the fact that any moment we might lose all that gives sense to our lives could mean to them what it does to us. <coughs> These are not the, the facts I mentioned, our mortality, our vulnerabilities, and misfortune, and so on. They're not just important facts about our nation. Our sense of the human condition is shaped by the forms, historically been shaped, by the forms of our critically reflective responses to them and by a sense of an ethical imperative to be lucid about them under pain of superficiality. And that imperative forms some people's sense that our humanity is not something given to us, fixed, but something we're called upon always to rise to, that it is to adapt Greg Denning's words, a verb, not a noun. But to see in a people, or in a group, just what Isdell could not see in the Aborigines, is a condition of seeing that their humanity is defined, just as ours is, by the possibility of an ever-deepening response to the meaning of those big facts that define the human condition. 
It was unintelligible to them in the sense, and this is, the, this is what I mean by here by being unintelligible, in the same way that it's unintelligible that a face that looked like a black and white minstrel caricature of an Afro-American Afro face, unintelligible that such a face could express all the emotions needed to play Othello. Not even in God, not even God could see in the black and white minstrel show's face the expressive possibilities needed to play Othello. Well, no doubt there are psychological reasons for their failure to see things right, but my concern here is not to speculate about what they are. It's to bring out in this case that, in the case of Isdell and also of M, the kind of human being that M thought she was had been formed within the conceptual space from which she excluded the Vietnamese. It's a space in which she explored and may have think of herself as obliged to explore under pain of superficiality, what it really means to love, to grieve, to be courageous in the face of misfortune, to face death with lucidity, and so on. With an effort of imagination, might, M might have acknowledged the protracted suffering could brutalize her to the point where she no longer saw her children or anybody else as irreplaceable. Or she might acknowledge that an accident could leave her feeble-minded, as it did her white neighbour, who recently did have a second child after the first child died, in much the same spirit as one might get a pup after a dog has died. Such acknowledgements are within the reach of her powers of imagination because they depend only on an imaginative sympathy with those who would have been like her had they not been struck by misfortune. But in her eyes, the Vietnamese are not as they are because they've suffered a misfortune. She could no more imagine how, in different circumstances, they could be like her than she could imagine herself to be the kind of person she sees as being appropriately caricatured by the black and white minister face. Though it may at first seem strange, it's important to my point to see that M does not see the Vietnamese as shallow. Rather, from her perspective, they don't exist in the conceptual space in which attributions of depth and shallowness even make sense. And that space I'm going to call, in the rest of this lecture, a realm of meaning. The philosopher Peter Winch once remarked, and I quote, treating a person justly involves treating with seriousness his or her own understanding of the situation and of what the situation demands, end of quote. But to take seriously a person's conception of his or her commitments and cares, one must be able to find it intelligible that she should explore those commitments and cares with an increasingly deepened understanding. It's to see her as a potential partner in that conversational space in which she is answerable to the demand or to the plea that she try to invest her thoughts and words with the authority of an indiv individually achieved lucidity that she speaks in her own voice. A voice that expresses, as Kierkegaard put it, that she's lived her own life and not anybody else's. That kind of individuating responsiveness, I think, is that she'd be essentially answerable to the possibility that she has asserted something only because she's sentimental or yielded to a tendency to bathos and so on. That's fundamental, I think, to our sense of what it is for a human being to be able to rise to the potentialities of humanity. And racists deny that capacity to the victims. And that's why I sometimes call racism a meaning blindness. It's not blind to this or that aspect of meaning in the lives of the victims of their denigration, but to the very possibility that their lives could be lived in the realm of meaning. People like M and Isdell can change. And when they do, it's often, as we all know, because they've lived with the people they denigrated perhaps because one of their children married one of them. That well-known fact should not have attempt one to a natural but fallacious inference, namely that the denigratory perceptions of racists 
The ones that express the thought that nothing can go deep with them are really the expressions of false empirical generalisations. To avoid that fallacious inference, we need to attend to an important distinction. It's the distinction between how racists like Isdell come to think of themselves as having been mistaken about what losing a child can mean to the victims of their integration, on the one hand, and how, on the other hand, they might come to acknowledge that they were mistaken in believing, for example, that blacks have significantly lower IQs than whites, are lazy, have inordinate sexual appetites, promiscuous, have rhythm in their blood to this an arbitrary number of stereotypes. Those stereotypes do have the conceptual form of empirical, that is to say, factual generalizations. And even when they are, in ways characteristic of racists, psychologically so entrenched as to be beyond rational consideration, sorry, rational correction, they are like beliefs that Germans are efficient, that Italians are good lovers, that it's hard to get a decent meal in London, and so on. They are empirical generalizations. But, and this is important, coming through living with a people to see dignity in faces that have looked all alike to us, to see the full range of human expressiveness in them, to hear suffering that lacerates the soul in someone's cry or in their music, or to hear depth, the whole depth of language and sounds that have merely seemed comical to us before. All of that is different from coming to realise that they score well on IQ tests or that the stereotypes which one has expressed to express one's hostility and had relied upon to defend that hostility were false generalisations. We don't, I think, discover the full humanity of a racially denigrated people in books by social scientists, not at any rate if those books merely contain knowledge of the kind that might be included in textbooks or encyclopedia. If we discover it by reading, then it will be in plays, in novels, in poetry, not in science, but in art. Thus, although the failure, certainly the continuous failure to see the depth of the inner lives of a racially denigrated people has psychological and social causes, those causes do not render people vulnerable to and sustain in them false empirical beliefs and bad arguments. They render them, as I put it, meaning blind. That, I think, is why when racists come to understand that they have been horribly mistaken, they're incredulous that they could have thought otherwise. The character of that incredulity, how could I not have seen that, is not adequately captured in the thought, how could I have been so ignorant or irrational as to believe those stereotypes and to have offered such bad arguments to support them? Well, is hostility to same-sex marriage like racism of that kind, blind to the possibility of depth in the inner lives of gays? Well, as you might have begun to suspect, my answer is that sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And to see why, it will be helpful to distinguish from one another three kinds of opposition to gay marriage. But before I do that, I want to say that I won't be considering opposition to gay marriage that's based solely on scripture or revelation. Law must hope to enjoy the consent of those who are governed by it. And in a secular society, people who are not religious cannot, I think, consent to be governed by law based on solely on scripture and on revelation. There are at least three kinds of opposition to gay marriage. First, there's homophobia of a kind that expresses itself in visceral disgust towards gay sex. Disgust and incredulity of the same kind as racial intermarriage provokes in racism, in racists. The disgust is not directed at the acts themselves, oral or anal sex, for example, but at such acts between men or between women, especially when they're the expression of erotic attraction rather than simply the expression of need, as it might be, for example, for men in prison. Like racists, though perhaps less explicitly, 
homophobes of this kind denigrate the entire inner lives of gays and lesbians. And like racists, they appeal to what they take to be the relatively plain facts to justify their denigration, usually alleged facts about what's natural and what's perverted. Anyone foolish enough to argue with racists and homophobes, homophobes comes to realise soon enough that they jump from justification to justification, betraying the fact that their feelings and attitudes have nothing much to do with the reasons that they offer in their support. And my point here is not that emotion makes racists and homophobes resistant to reason. It's really that reasons they cite are not the causes of their belief and their hostility, but merely the rationalisation of them. It's important to realise, however, that though this kind of homophobia would, as a matter of natural psychological fact, incline those who are afflicted by it to have opposed the decriminalisation of gay sex, it need not have done so. Consistently with liberal principles, they could believe that it's not the state's business to interfere with what consenting adults do when nobody's harmed by what they do, even if they find it disgusting. But such a person could not believe that gays and lesbians should be permitted to marry. Whatever else the mar marriage is, marriage is a celebration of a sexual union. And nobody could approve the celebration and solemnisation of something that they find disgusting. This kind of homophobe might also, because he or she is committed to principles of equality and to non-discrimination, strongly support civil unions and the legal benefits that have accrued to them in many nations. There is no inconsistency in thinking that people who have lived together should be able to pass on their property and so on, even if one finds the fact that they live together sexually disgusting or finds them wicked and perverted. Many religious people who believe gay sex to be intrinsically evil, as they sometimes put it, intrinsically dysfunctional and deeply contrary to nature could nonetheless, and some do nonetheless, also believe that gays should enjoy such legal entitlements. Again, of course, there are psychological obstacles to believe in believing both that gay sex is disgusting and intrinsically evil and also believing that gays should enjoy the legal benefits of civil unions, but that's a psychological, not a conceptual message. A second kind of opposition is essentially socio-political. Some people oppose gay marriage only because of the deleterious social consequences they believe would follow if the state undermined marriage as an institution between men and women. They have a variety of reasons for this, but they're all empirical reasons, and as such do not express a view about the very nature of marriage. Such reasons are open to empirical assessment, and provided that they don't disguise homophobic attitudes, people who are persuaded by them will be, on the whole, genuinely open to discussion about what evidence exists for them. They may think, for example, that other things being equal, it's better for children to be raised by a man and a woman than only by people of the same sex. And that is an empirical claim, and must be assessed as that. It's as irrational for gays to oppose it on a priori grounds as it is for those who support it to do so. Well, perhaps you'll now by now have anticipated the third reason why people oppose gay marriage. They believe that it's of the very nature of marriage that it's between a man and a woman. Unlike homophobes of the kind I described earlier, their view of what makes gay and lesbian love unsuited to become married love does not infect their entire perception of gays and lesbians. They believe nonetheless that gays and lesbians cannot have what they most deeply want, not because the law will forbid it, but because the law cannot make married love out of love that is intrinsically unsuited to it, even if, on their on this view of things, even if the law were misguidedly to permit same-sex marriage, this thought continues, these would be marriages in inverted commas only. The state cannot do what it is conceptually impossible to do. And if it were to try to do so by permitting same-sex marriage, it would sow confusion and degrade the concept of marriage. 
if the concept is degraded, this thought continues, it will be virtually impossible, even for heterosexual couples, to properly understand what they do when they get married. But that's just a, follows logically from the idea of a degraded concept. This objection, it's important to see, is not essentially moral, or perhaps more accurately, one, fa one fails to see what's most interesting about it if one thinks that it's essentially moral. In support of Rowan Williams's opposition to gay marriage, expressed early this year, to my great disappointment, I have to say, uh, Canon Glyn Webster, a senior member of the General Synod, said, and I quote, it's only possible for marriage to be between a man and a woman. He went on to say, I'm not saying that there can't be loving relationships between people of the same sex, but that doesn't equate to marriage, end of quote. But of course, loving relationships between men and women don't equate to marriage either, no matter how deeply committed to one another they may be, but never mind that. When Canon Webster said that marriage is only possible between a man and a woman, he did not mean that it's morally or religiously, sorry, he did not mean only that it's morally or religiously out of the question, in the way that he might believe that anal sex is morally or religiously out of the question. A moral or religious prohibition on anal sex does not prevent acts of anal sex from actually being just that, acts of anal sex. It doesn't make them acts of anal sex in inverted commas only. <laughs> but the canon meant that nothing that gays do would count as marriage. Nothing that they could do could fall under a serious concept of marriage. How, it seems irresistible to ask, could he believe that, given that he acknowledged that there could be as he put it, I quote again, loving relationships between people of the same sex. The answer, I think, goes roughly like this. He believes that gay couples love each other as persons, I'm sorry, as persons, and that perhaps their love of one another is in some way coloured by the fact that they have sex. But the love and the sex can't come together to deepen one another in the way required by marriage. To put it simply, but I don't think the thought comes in much better versions, the thought is that their relation is one of love plus sex. Sex is there as a kind of addition, but not integral to the love, to its nature as love. Its nature as love and its nature as sex are not interdependent with one another. But marriage is essentially the celebration of a sexual union not only the union of friends and companions who also give one another sexual pleasure. Marriage, this thought continues, is the recognition of the way our sexual nature goes deep in our sense of what it means to be human, deep in a way that couldn't be conveyed by thinking of it, thinking of sex, that is, only as an instrument of pleasure, no matter how intense or unique the pleasure but what is here affirmed as conceptually impossible by the canon is exactly what gays affirm as possible and actual. What they want, I believe, is the affirmation of the depth of their sexual being in the constitution of their sense of their humanity. The, the denial of it, they feel, to be a diminution of their humanity, rather than merely, if I might put it this way, a denial of their civil rights or other obligations to them, simply as persons or citizens. To conceive the wrong done to gays when they're denied marriage, simply as unjust discrimination, is to conceive it in the wrong dimension, on the wrong plane, as it were. It only touches the surface of the deep insult to them. Some years ago, a prominent Australian became notorious when he claimed that rape could not be the same kind of offence against prostitutes as it, against, as it is against women who are not prostitutes. He meant that prostitutes had so degraded their sexuality that nothing could count as a serious violation of it. But the view that informs the kind of opposition to gay marriage that I'm elaborating is not, that, not simply that, that gay sex degrades sexuality. Rather, it's the view that gay sex takes sex out of the realm where the concept of degradation has any application. 
and recall in this connection my claim that racists don't see the victims of their denigration as shallow, but they see them as excluded from the realm in which concepts of death and shallowness have serious application. The prostitute, according to the man I reported, could give up prostitution and then rise to what he would take to be the ethical, ethical requirements that are inseparable from our sense that sex can be something precious and which therefore makes rape a crime different in kind and more terrible than even the brutal violation of autonomy when it's aggravated by severe physical injury. The critics of gay marriage do not say, first give up the bathhouse sex and rise to the dignity of your sexuality and then we'll talk about marriage. Gays, they believe, can't rise to the dignity of human sexuality without ceasing to be gays. Gays on this view offend against their humanity, against the dignity of the human person, as Catholics often put it, but not, as the man in my example thought, the prostitute does. Much more radically on this view, gays offend against their sexuality by taking it out of the realm of meaning altogether. And that does not, of course, mean that from his perspective, they can't be wronged if they're raped. But they then seem to be wronged simply as persons assaulted and brutalised, not as beings whose sexuality could be precious in a way that makes rape one of the worst of crimes and why it's right to seize in certain contexts as a crime against humanity. And that marks a very different a very important difference between meaning blindness as it occurs in the case of gay sexuality and it as it occurs in the case of racism. In the case of M and Isdell, I said that when one sees that they find it unintelligible that blacks can be individuals, unique and irreplaceable as we can be, then we also see that they find it unintelligible that anything that we could do against them or they could do to one another, could count as wrongs in the way that we can be wronged. But only the most extreme of the visceral homophobes that I described earlier thinks that about gays. Ken and Webster, I said, seem to be saying that nothing that gays do would count as marriage. Nothing that states or churches could do could make a couple, a gay couple, a married couple, Rather, as people used to say, that nothing could make an institution a university if it had no philosophy department or classics department or physics department, though, of course, many institutions that didn't have them were called university, misguidedly, people thought. <laughs> a statement from Lambeth Palace said, quote, the church still believes on the basis of the Bible and tradition that marriage is between a man and a woman. The reference to tradition is interesting because it opens us to the possibility that the conceptual features of marriage are historically contingent, that up to a point, even the conceptual limits are open to change. And that should anyhow be obvious, because even if it were true, as people sometimes put it, that marriage is and always has been between the man and woman, there's no reason of itself, on the basis of that claim, to think it can't justifiably change. There is, after all, such a thing as justifiable conceptual revision. Grant, therefore, for the sake of argument, that marriage has no platonic form that gives it an immutable essence, that there are no truths about it written in the heavens. Grant, too, for the sake of argument, that each generation must find its own voice in which to make marriage authentic in their lives. Still, are there not conceptual limits Limits that can't be changed by Parliament or by any committee or by any dictator of fears as to what can count seriously as marriage. Could anything count as marriage? Well, there are such limits. Who, for example, would take as a marriage vow a vow, a couple, uh, a vow that would make a couple married if it went something like this? I take you, X, for a wedded partner, forsaking all others until someone too irresistible comes along <laughs> and being apart from her becomes too painful to me, or until things become tough for other reasons. That would be the caricature of a marriage realm. 
Love transformed and deepened by a vow appears to be the essence of marriage. And fidelity to a death appears to be the essence of the vow. Without it, marriage would be nothing more than a purely contractual arrangement. Many people appear to think that that's what it is in fact, but if gays and lesbians are seeking a merely contractual arrangement to govern their relationships and civil rights to go with it, they don't have to seek getting married. Now, my purpose in saying what I did is not to praise fidelity generally or traditional conceptions of marriage, fidelity in particular. It is to suggest that a long tradition has given to us a conception of fidelity whose value is not reducible to, though it may be in some ways connected with, its practical or prudential value in, for example, stabilising relationships or being good for children. Anybody who knows even a little of the long tradition of reflection on what it means to become married knows that at its deepest, it's not about the social purposes that marriage might serve. Or to put the point more strongly, it's only because the meaning of marriage transcends whatever social purposes it might justifiably serve that it has depth rather than mere complexity. The purposes that things serve may be complex, but reflection about them about whether they started on the meaning of its constitutive vows to deepen without limits in the course of a lifetime. And one might say that's how it has to be. If it's all depth and a Deming's remark, one might say marriage is a verb, not a noun. There has, of course, been an alternative tradition that has debunked fidelity from the perspective of an ordained worldliness. And there's been a tra tradition of romantic celebration of fidelity that is of least intention with marriage. And of course, there's reductionist debunking of all of them. Nonetheless, a long tradition of reflection has made it seem a conceptual truth about marriage that a deep and sexual love by the vow to forsake all others until death, rather like traditional reflection on the academic form of the life of the mind, made it seem like a conceptual truth that nothing could properly be called a university if it doesn't nourish a philosophy or a classics or a physics department. The deep insult to gaze, therefore, that's expressed in the attitude I've been elaborating is not that they're psychological, it's not sorry, the accusation that they're psychologically incapable of fidelity. They are, after all, on this view, capable of assessing and weighing its practical prudential value <coughs> and connected with that of companionship in old age. The deep insult to them is the assumption that because their renunciation of promiscuity has not lived in the realm of meaning, it can't be reflectively deepened, cannot be transformed in the way marriage is believed to transform sexual love in fidelity. But since, the, it, since it appears that the vow of fidelity can't be dropped, the argument runs, gay sexuality does not have the depth to be open to its transformative power. And for that reason, even if those gays who have no desire to marry and who may be opposed to marriage as a bourgeois patriarchal convention that actually stifles the potentialities for death in gay sex, even they have reason to campaign for gays to be permitted to marry and to do it for reasons that are deeper than liberal arguments or conventional demands for equal rights. <coughs> well, I come now to what might seem to be an obvious objection to much of what I've said. Marriage, this objection says, is essentially between a man and a woman, because sexual love, is between, sexual love between them can be deepened in a ways that it can't be in the case of gays and lesbians by the connection with the possibility of bringing new life into the world. The idea here is not merely that sexuality between the man and woman enables a fertile couple the pleasure of having children, nor even just the idea that it permits a woman the pleasure of carrying them. Rather, it's the idea that its connection with the wonder and miracle of life deepens heterosexual love through and through, deepening the lover's understanding of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. <coughs> Now, there are, of course, nasty versions of this thought, versions that speak of gay and lesbian lovers, perverse, degenerate, intrinsically disordered and dysfunctional, intrinsically evil, and so on. 
But a centuries of our art testify not every version of that thought must be developed in anything like those ways. For the sake of the argument then, grant that. Even then, however, two things seem to be obvious. First, this is not a dispute that the state can buy into. And if that's so, then no, no side to that dispute can inform law. Secondly, even if it's true that love connected with the possibility of bringing children into the world has potentialities for death that other forms of sexual love don't have, why should that be a reason for thinking that love between gays lacks the kind of death necessary for it to become married love? Why should that be a reason for doubting that gay and lesbian love can worthily rise, be vitally responsive to a full and deep understanding of what it means to be married, of what it means for love to be transformed by the marriage vow, for love worthily to become married love. To put it very crudely, the best is not the enemy of the good, nor even the sublime, the enemy of the wonderful. Well, recall now my earlier remark <coughs> that many young people are incredulous that whether gay should be permitted to marry should even be thought of as a serious the discussable matter. They're incredulous about this in the way they would be, that we all would be, if banning interracial marriage were again to be on the agenda. <clears throat> but is that analogy with racial intermarriage unjust? Many religious people uh, believe that the reasons for their belief about gay marriage are like their reasons for belief about abortion or euthanasia available to the exercise of reason, reason exercised properly in good faith, independently of faith and scripture. They have indeed put forward very sophisticated arguments, and in this they differ, I think, from racists, whose arguments were always obscurantist and backed by pseudoscience. Only ignorance of how sophisticated such arguments are <coughs> could allow people to think that people who accept them or take them seriously must be irrational or lacking in intellectual acumen. Should we not therefore be open to those arguments and if we disagree with them, simply accept that some people are opposed to gay marriage because they accept those arguments intelligently and in good faith? Is it not slander to suggest that what's at issue is something like racism? Well, every form of argument must leave itself open to rejection on the grounds that its conclusions are absurd or repugnant. That's not controversial, I think. When I think of some of the gay relationships I know, some of them gays united by a civil service, but who would have become married if they'd been permitted. When I recall some of the poetry that celebrates gay love, I find the claim that it is intrinsically evil or intrinsically unsuited to celebration intrinsically unworthy of a marriage vows, I find that repellent. And when I reflect further on the fact, as it seems to me to be a fact, that for many people, such arguments are persuasive and are considered seriously only because they believe implicitly, perhaps not even very consciously, that gay sex can't have the death that would make it worthy of celebration in marriage, that gays who want to be married want something that is of its very nature impossible, then it seems to me, as I have tried to suggest, those claims fail to find the reductio ad absurdum because the full humanity of gays is not fully visible to those who put them forward, who take them seriously. And that's why I said earlier that like the kind of racism that I elaborated, this kind of opposition to gay marriage is not based on ignorance of what are ordinarily called facts, nor is it an expression of irrationality. It's not a refusal to rise to the claims of reasons. It's a form of meaning blindness. It is, of course, nonetheless, the expression of a kind of ignorance. The ignorance can be cured, though not by philosophy or metaphysics or science, but by art or by poetry, novels, painting and film and by the kind of experience that I spoke of earlier in connection with racism, when people come to see death in people or in lives when they hadn't before because they live with them and they engage with imaginative sympathy 
in those lives. Then you will recall I drew attention to the important difference between coming to see dignity in faces that had previously looked alike to one, or to see in a black body all that could invite a tender caress rather than merely excite lust. To see that on the one hand, and to learn on the other hand through experience or reading scientific literature that the factual stereotypes one had entertained were in fact false. It's important now to remember, uh, especially now that as something that we're resistant uh, to accepting, and I remember it especially at an annual lecture on bigotry and intolerance. And what's important to remember is this, that it's not always a good thing to be open to persuasion. It's not good to be open to persuasion that the earth is flat, or that one can read one's future in coffee grounds, or that Elvis is alive and working for the CIA. <laughs> to have an open mind on those matters is proof that one's gullible, which is no virtue. It betrays the failure of judgment that fatally undermines the very capacity for radical critique that we hope will be achieved by always having an open mind. Some forms of open-mindedness are aptly caricatured in the joke that tells of a person whose mind was so open that his brain fell through. <laughs> Morally, too, there are things about which one should not have an open mind. Not so much because it would betray a serious failure of judgment, not because it would betray an intellectual failing, but because one should fear to be the kind of person who believes them and takes them into her life. It's not a moral or intellectual virtue to have an open mind about ethnic cleansing, genocide, castrated male pedophiles, or stoning women to death for adultery. To believe that a case might be made for such evils and that one should be open to be pers being persuaded by them. Or that the injustices committed by Israel against the Palestinians prove that Hitler got at least one thing right. It's not dogmatic to refuse to be open to persuasion about those matters. Nor is it just a sign of decency. It's a criterion for moral seriousness. It's a conceptual truth, I think, a truth we can discern merely by reflecting on the concept of moral value, that a person must, must take seriously the moral values that he or she professes. To refuse to be open to some moral views is intrinsic to the kind of seriousness that defines morality and distinguishes it from other kinds of value. And for that reason, one should distinguish what a person finds undiscussable from what she believes passionately, perhaps even dogmatically. In the latter case, she may also not be open to persuasion, but then it would be for reasons, probably all bad, that are extraneous to morality. She may be brought to see that she should be open to argument and that only psychological obstacles stand in the way of it. Someone who believes something to be undiscussable and someone who thinks it's discussable stand in different relations to one another than do people with strong opposing convictions. The examples I gave are, I hope, uncontroversial. Can one seriously rank, aside, rank alongside them arguments against gay marriage, or would that be outrageous? But it wouldn't be outrageous if it's true that when gays demand the right to marry, they demand acknowledgement of their full humanity. Is that hyperbole? I believe it's not. Recall my earlier claim that to acknowledge someone as a fellow human being is to see him or her as capable of rising fully in full responsiveness to the meaning of the defining facts of the human condition. And one of those defining facts is our sexuality and the way it goes deep with us, so deep as to be fundamental to our sense of identity. The incredulity of younger people, as I characterise it, is therefore not an expression of intolerance <clears throat> or of a closed mind in a uh, reprehensible sense. And one can begin to see how far the analogy with racism can be pressed if one knows two things. Firstly, demand, the demand that the law should permit same-sex marriage is not at all like the demand for equal access to goods and opportunities. If it were, then some generous version of civil union would be acceptable. To many gay and lesbians, however, to demand the right to marry is not like demanding yet more of something that exists on the same continuum as, say, the right to inherit property. It's in a different dimension. It is, to be sure, a demand for justice, 
but like the demand that the full humanity of the indigenous peoples be acknowledged in law, so the demand to have the right to marry is not a demand for justice as fairness. It's a demand for justice conceived as a quality of respect for the dignity of one's humanity. It is, I think, absurd to think that the demand to be acknowledged as fully human is of the same kind as a demand for equal access to goods and opportunity. opportunities. Anti-racism continues to be one of the great movements of the post-war period, going backwards, unfortunately. Though foolish things have been said and done in its name, and though unjust accusations of racism have actually contributed to racism, it can hardly be doubted that the world is the best place to be. The same is true of feminism and the gay liberation movements. All have expressed a concern for equality that can't adequately be captured by talk of equal access to goods and opportunities. Treat me as a person, see me fully as a human being, as fully or equal without degradation or condescension. These are not demands for things whose value lies in the degree to which they enable one to get other things. Their calls to justice conceived as a quality of respect, calls to become part of the constituency within which claims for equal access to goods and opportunities may then appropriately be pressed. If I'm right, concern for a justice in the community should be in critical part a concern that its institutions enable us to see and to be responsive to when we see the full humanity in our fellow human beings. Amongst those institutions, the ones that express the character of our responses to the defining facts of the human condition are paramount. They are institutions that have to do with birth, a vulnerability to misfortune, death, and of course, sexuality. I think maybe 10 minutes for questions. We did run a little late in starting. Uh, and we have some roving mics. Um, so who would like to get us started? I think there's a question here. You could just wait for the mic to reach you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. And I'm probably one of those incredulous young people who you were talking about. But I'm interested in the reasons that you've given us tonight. Um, People often, when they're arguing against gay marriage, make sort of a slippery slope argument. So they say, oh, the next thing is that people will be marrying animals or something like this. And um, I think that maybe what you've been saying does suggest the idea that we should recognize incestuous marriages or polygamous marriages. And I think I'm curious if you think that that's right and what you think about it. Uh, well, uh, uh, slippery slopes never occur in, in cultural backgrounds. Um, they occur in particular cultures, and whether one's fearful of a slippery slope depends on one's assessment of the culture, for example. Uh, what I think, uh, what, what I think is right in what, sorry, what I think is right in what people might be getting at when they make a slippery slope argument is that is more or less what I said, which is that they think there are certain conceptual features of marriage. Uh, features such that if uh, we got rid of them, for whatever good reason we might have, it might be compassion, desire for equality, and so on, we would destroy the concept and therefore would make it impossible for anybody really to understand what we're doing when they're married. The analogy here is, is as I suggested very briefly, with universities. The concept of you know, there used to be a concept of university such that it seemed to be a kind of conceptual truth. Uh, that you couldn't justify, the, an institution couldn't justify that you call the university uh, unless it had a philosophy department, etc. Et uh, and that, at a certain point, disappeared. Uh, in part, now no university thinks about what it does under such a concept. Uh, and it disappeared in part uh, because, for reasons to do with uh, a desire um, to oppose the, the sort of arrogant prestige of institutions called universities, 
government gave a name to institutions that in no way could have fallen under the traditional concept. Well, that has obviously to a degree destroyed the concept. And now our young people in institutions called universities can't find their way back to thinking about what they do <coughs> under anything like the old concept. Now, I think there are people who think the same thing would happen if we took out one of the core conceptual teachers uh, of marriage, which is just between a man and a woman, and implicitly because it's got to do with having children. So the only thing one can do there is to ask, why do you think it's a core conceptual feature? And what I've been trying to suggest is that what's really going on here are not the, is not simply the arguments being put up. And the arguments by some Catholics on this are going to be very sophisticated. They really are. And in that sense, they're quite different from arguments used as support brochures in which all those radically obscure answers uh, but what's going on there uh, is, is, as I've been trying to suggest, a failure to see death, the possibility of death. And the only thing I think that one can do when that happens is to try to present people with things that would reveal that death. Uh, and that's partly, of course, living with people. That happens in racism. It's not arguments of the racism. It's just, it's, I think it's a deep liberal illusion to think that, that, that philosophy or science uh, could seriously undermine Moses' belief. Uh, because, as I suggested in my talk, the incapacity to see dignity in a face, because one sees it like the black and white minstrel's face, is an incapacity of a radically different kind to face the evidence about our cues, for example. So I think the only thing one can do there is, is, is to hope that exactly what's happening to young people like yourself, that, that, that for all sorts of cultural reasons, they see the text, they could never question it. And it's part, it's part because, uh, and I will say it's really art of one kind or another, I think this happens. But the simply so argument in its traditional form presupposes that what's going on here on the part of gays, the real, uh, 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 people who are anti gay marriage, is that there is the, it's, uh, sorry, the traditional fear of the slippery slope by people who oppose gay marriage is based on the assumption that what's going on here really is an argument in the traditional sense. It's not. And that's why I'm never being able to be thrown. Thank you. Dr. Gator, many of us, some of us here, come from very strict Catholic or religious backgrounds. And you talked there about justice and not about justice. Why are the churches, particularly the Catholic Church, so hostile to gay marriages? And not just Catholic, but also many of the Protestant denominations. Why are they so out of touch with justice? Uh, well, as, as I try to suggest, I, I, I think that on one hand there are very um, complex arguments that, that, just, that especially the Catholic tradition has put forth uh, by its moral theologians and its moral philosophers. <laughs> uh, and I think that partly prevents Catholics who are post, post I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming we're not talking about homophobes who find the whole thing disgusting, but we're, we're, we're talking about liberals who would sincerely say that there should be civil unions, there should be equal rights, etc., etc., but not marriage. And they're the ones who decide to be conversant with the arguments and mistake the fact that they find the arguments persuasive for what's really going on, which is what I'm trying to suggest is a blindness to the meaning. In it. And therefore, it's in that sense, in that which is still a form of racism. So, so, so if you ask, why, how, how could the churches in the past right, have themselves been so supportive of racism? The answer is going to be, well, like all racism, racists, they fail to see the death and the lives of the victims of their denigration. And I think that's what's going on now in the case of gays, gay and gay sexuality. Because it's really interesting to see that this is why I, I made the point in relation to Karen Webster's remark. He, 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 he wasn't expressing, in, in the first instance, and most interestingly, a moral and religious prohibition. When he said it's impossible, 
He made it impossible in roughly the way that people used to say it's impossible to have a university if you don't have a philosophy of Christ. It was, it's that kind of point. And therefore he thinks it doesn't matter what you do, you can't make something out of what's conceptually impossible. And he would think that in those uh, countries in the world that are permitted to marriage, the gays who have been married under those laws are married only in inverted commas. In the same way as, let's say, black slave owners, to insist that, that their slaves get married, you know, but who didn't think for a minute that breaking the slave law, con the slave law constituted a serious injustice to them in the way it would against the white men, they thought that their black slaves were, of course, married only in inverted commas because they couldn't rise to the dignity and depth of their sexuality. Otherwise, they would see that raping a slave girl could be as terrible as raping a white man. But they found that actually unintelligible. Even the ones who would find it cruel, but they would think it's cruel, or the they can be cruel as a dog or something like that. Um, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was thinking about your talk in relation to um, in, in relation to Mr. Stanhope's remarks before your talk, and I'm wondering how, if we if we accept your argument, how we then explain the position of those in politics who we suspect might think that gay marriage is okay and who are personally untroubled by it, but who don't think it's worth losing any votes over. Now, does that indicate? Either that they have no moral compass whatsoever, other than the opinion poll, um, or that they are suffering from the same, the, the kind of mean and blindness that you were talking about. Yeah, I, th I think they are suffering from uh, some degree of mean and blindness, and that's why I started uh, off the talk expressing that on the part of myself. I said I, uh, that uh, in that conversation that I reported in London, uh, Peter and I just took for granted. Uh, that as uh, Christine Keneally put it in the case of the Labour Party, it's not a core issue. Uh, and, that, and that's because uh, failing to see that it really is an issue of death, of mean environment, we fail to see the terrible insult that it really is. The terrible thing that it really is to say this is not a core issue. Uh, and I saw that on that occasion only because I caught the pain in his eyes that suddenly made me realise, my God, what, why, why do we assume that? Uh, so so it, 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 it's really a, a, a case of, of, of people coming to see uh, that... Uh, it is partly see the language that obscures this because it's all talk about civil rights, equality, equality before the law and so on. And that kind of language can't get to the depth of hurt that's felt by gays. You can't capture that by saying, I violated your rights, or I denied you your rights. I mean, it, that, that may be well, that's important, that the rights is such a difficult concept, and of course, it, it has its place in political discourse. But usually to say that a person's rights have been violated is not to capture the nature of the wrong done to them. When someone's raped, you, you don't capture what's wrong by saying, oh my God, their rights have been violated. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, many people who aren't against interracial marriages but are against gay marriages, they often justify it by saying, hang on, people didn't choose to be of a different race, but some people choose to be gay. How would you incorporate such an argument into your framework? Uh, well, I'm saying yes. Uh, well, I don't, well, first of all, it, and I wouldn't engage in the argument as to whether they choose to be gay or, or not choose to be gay. I'd say, what's wrong with being gay? So if you choose it, if, you, if, it's, if it's in fact uh, can be something fine and, and uh, precious, if I mean gay sexuality can be, what, what does it matter that you choose it? What does degrade it though is to describe it as a lifestyle choice. You can't, you can't capture anything deep in a language like that. But as for whether it's chosen or whether it's not, that's, that's a, a kind of technical argument that seems to me relevant, quite irrelevant. Yeah, let's put it this way, you've conceded far too much 
when you, if you start arguing whether it's a choice or whether it's not a choice. Could, can I just say one other thing about, about, about why, why Catholics? Uh, I think it's partly uh, because for some reason it has, has, it has escaped them that they can hold on to the idea that sex, when it's connected with the possibility of children, has a depth that it doesn't have when it's not. They can hold on to that idea, it seems to me, and still acknowledge that gay relationships have a depth that's fully worthy of the marriage bond. And I think that's a distinction that they often don't draw. I'm not saying that, that, that it has that depth in the relation of children or not. Well, I'm saying this has been a very central argument always in the debate. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it has its problems because once you go from the example where a couple are intentionally trying to have a child all the way to infertile couples trying to keep the connection, everybody knows that has its problems. But supposing, just for the sake of argument, that you could keep the connection all the way through to infertile heterosexual couples or heterosexual couples who don't want to have children. Suppose for the sake of argument that the Catholic theologians who argue that are right. Just suppose that. Why should that be a reason to oppose gay marriage? The best you can say is that it can't have the kind of depth that's possible here. But why then deny that it has a kind of depth that would make it a worthy recipient of the marriage? Thank you.